Good afternoon. It's 1.03 p.m. and we are now convening the Senate Committee on Housing as well as the House of Representatives Committee on Housing for an informational briefing on the Hawaii Public Housing Authority's Project Kale Mowi. We won't be taking public testimony at this time. And um, I think that's all we need to say at the beginning. So um, I'd like to invite Executive Director Wansapi to begin the presentation. And while he's doing so, I'd like to welcome my house counterpart, Representative of the Fashion Meadow, and I also see Committee Member Rhodes from the Senate. Do you want to introduce your house members? Thank you, Senator. We also have um, Luke Epslin here. So thank you, Luke, for joining us. Uh, aloha, everyone. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Chair Chang and Chair Hashimoto and the members of the committees and your hardworking staff for allowing us this opportunity to provide you with an update on the Housing Authority and its uh, Kalei Lome RFQ as part of the uh, solution to solving our affordable housing crisis in our great state. We know how extremely busy you are, and we certainly uh, very much appreciate this opportunity. My name is Hakim Wansafi. I'm the Executive Director for the Hawaii Public Housing Authority. And with me today are uh, Chief Development Officer Kevin Auger, uh, Chief Planner Benjamin Park, Development Officer Andrew Tang, uh, Deputy AG uh, Linda Chow, and Deputy AG Clement Urbank. We were planning on being there in person. Uh, however, uh, multiple people are out from my office due to COVID, and we just want to make sure that everyone is safe. So for those who are not familiar with our agency, uh, the HPHA is one of only three statewide agencies in the United States. Uh, by overall program size, out of about 3,300 housing authorities in the nation, we operate the 13th largest public housing authority uh, program uh, in the uh, country, and this is for the public housing programs. Uh, overall, we operate the 24th largest out of 3,300 uh, when we count all uh, programs that we have, public housing as well as the voucher uh, uh, program. We are uh, operate uh, multiple programs, just go over them very quickly. Uh, our federally funded programs include the federal law income public housing, approximately $37 million a year. The housing choice voucher that, as you know, includes Section 8, the regular referred to as Section 8 program, the Veteran Affairs Supportive Housing referred to as VASH, the Non-Elderly Disabled Voucher, uh, NAD, the Foster Youth to Independence Voucher, and the Emergency Housing Voucher. These combined uh, bring into the state approximately $65 million. Uh, in addition to that, we operate the Performance-Based Contract Administration, also known as the PBCA, uh, totaling approximately $45 million. Uh, and we do get about $15 million of uh, CFP uh, to take care of about uh, 5,400 federal property, uh, federal units that we have. Uh, from our state side, we also uh, uh, run the state public housing, uh, totaling about $5 million. The mandate is to operate out of break even. The legislature was kind enough uh, to provide us this $5 million each year, so we are not uh, uh, increase the rent on those who are in the state public housing. Majority of them are elderly and disabled. Uh, and the rent supplement program, as you know, uh, it's operating last year at about one and a half million. Uh, as you can see, in general, uh, uh, the HPHA is about 95% uh, federally funded. Uh, our current 300 or so positions, there is only one that is A funded. Uh, this chart will just show you uh, what we do, and we've been in existence since 1935 with the mission to provide and promote adequate and affordable housing, economic opportunity and suitable living environment for our low income and very low income individuals uh, free from discrimination. Uh, currently, our, our capacity is about 1400 families and we currently house about 45,000 individuals. Uh, 
uh, as you can also see from the slide, the majority of these families that we serve, they earn between zero and 15% of the area median income. Our goals and objectives uh, for the housing is uh, number one, to maximize the potential of our existing uh, public housing by fixing the units and get to the absolute maximum running at 99.9% .9 occupancy. Mm -hmm. Uh, we also, for this year, to inform you, we expect to house an additional 2,200 to 2,500 individuals. Uh, and most of them will be through the preference that includes the homeless, the involuntary displaced, and the victims of domestic abuse. Uh, a, a very important priority is to increase our inventory through development of additional affordable units. This is crucial as any time we open our waitlist, thousands do apply with only about three to 500 units becoming available each year. So there is a tremendous amount of needs for, 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 for the folks that are uh, the most vulnerable. Uh, we're pleased to also inform you that we are a move to work agency. Uh, uh, move to work also referred to as MTW is a demonstration program operated by the Department of Housing and Urban Development which allows the housing authorities to be more flexible and efficient on how they operate and spend the fees than the monies that they receive. Uh, MTW is highly competitive. And last year, there was only one available uh, for large housing authorities in the, in, in the entire nation. And we are grateful that we have been the winner of that designation. Uh, as the HPHA was deemed by HUD as a high performer through our CMAP score of 100 out of 100, and uh, due to HPHA has zero fi audit findings for many consecutive years. Uh, uh, this is a, a quick timeline. Uh, uh, the, the ACC amendment was executed to be officially uh, considered an MTW agency in August, 2022. Uh, uh, this uh, really pause and really thank the legislature for, for, for the amount of funding that uh, they have been giving us through the years. Uh, so we, we have budgeted about $165 million and in contract $113 million uh, that's in the street uh, with the others uh, uh, are getting expended sometime soon and we do not anticipate to lapse any money and we have not done so. Uh, going to our ongoing developments, and I know you're familiar with them. Uh, this is our School Street project uh, where our offices are on the HPHE campus, which will deliver 800 units of 100% affordable uh, housing, uh, affordable for life and for our seniors. The master planning and environmental clearance were complete. The light tech, Hulame, multifamily bonds, and rental housing revolving fund have been awarded. The approved uh, 21H zoning entitlement uh, uh, was successful, not in the agency about $9 million in exemptions and fee waivers. And the permits and subdivision are now pending and close to be completed. We anticipate them in the next couple of months. Uh, commencement of this project is anticipated uh, at the end of this year. And as you know, we have came to the legislature seeking some uh, funding because of the increased construction cost and the interest rate. Phase one, as you know, is 250 units. Uh, these are uh, what was the existing uh, 13 cottages uh, that consist of the administrative campus. They were underutilized land, uh, built in 1953, 65 years old, approximately to the PUC, and convenient public transportation right outside. Uh, also very close to the planned heart station, less than one mile from the site, and also across the street from the Lanakila Senior Center. The program will eventually consolidate operations to free the remaining site for the development of these 800 units uh, uh, that will be affordable for life, 30 to 60% EMI. Uh, there are no market units, and no public housing, and approximately anticipating about 10,000 square feet of commercial space uh, as part of phase three. Uh, and if the funding is available, uh, we are uh, able and ready as, as is our developers to uh, execute the remaining 550 units, phase two and three, 
uh, all at the same time, funding, uh, uh, permitting. Uh, the other project that you are familiar with is the KPT. As you know, we have done the first P3 uh, uh, housing project in Hawaii, and we successfully completed phase one in 2012. Uh, we are currently working on phase two, which will consist of uh, 650 new affordable housing units. For this uh, specific project, uh, the approval of 21H zoning was uh, was done, uh, and the entitlement uh, provided about $10 million of exemptions uh, through the City Council Resolution 22-240. Uh, the 4% light tech and the Honolulu May bonds and RHF QAP application was submitted on time in February of this year, and we're pending uh, results of that. And the the developer for this project is the Michael uh, organization. They are our, our partners. Uh, if funding available, and this one as well, uh, the developers has uh, uh, presented to us that they can do both phase two and phase three at the same time. This one, uh, to, to, it's a 22 acre uh, property. Um, uh, currently has about 174 public housing units and we're gonna increase that to 650 where this is a also a federal property uh we select federal properties because they're attractive as far as the uh, the operations of it and uh, we are replacing one for one the public housing component and the public housing component as you also know uh, they pay 30 percent of their income so if the income is zero they pay zero rent and the federal, gov federal government subsidized the rest. Um, uh, we, uh, it's about one, two story townhomes right now, about 29 of them. So the opportunity is big and we taking advantage of it, uh, being able to do three phases with the phase one that I just mentioned, gone through all the process and uh, we can do phase two and phase three simultaneously, all depending on the availability of funding. Uh, some of the challenges that you all know is uh, we are experiencing a high demand for housing coupled with the decades low housing supply, limited land, and high production costs. Uh, Honolulu, as you know, is ranked among the most expensive residential markets in the nation. Uh, as the housing costs continue to increase, the number of available affordable housing options of any kind continue to decline leaving low to moderate income household with limited housing options. And many housing, uh, many households are forced to double up with friends and family or relocate uh, great distances from their places of work in urban centers, resulting in secondary impacts such as lengthened commute times, uh, traffic congestion, uh, increased population, negative social environment. And in many cases, some people have left town uh, uh, to uh, to seek better opportunities. Uh, also an increase in uh, uh, many residents that we have said displace. And I said it twice because my son is one of those who decided to uh, stay in Pittsburgh where he attended law school. Uh, the, the HPHA is not unique. Uh, in, in the challenges that that we face, uh, uh, all housing authorities across the United States have similar, uh, specifically the high priced uh, real estate areas like San Francisco and others. Uh, also, the uh, the chronic underfunding from the federal government for capital improvement to address uh, deferred maintenance across the aging property portfolio. To address these uh, challenges, the HPHA has solicited qualification statements from experienced developers with a documented track record uh, of working collaboratively and cooperatively with the public partners who can marshal the resources necessary to produce multiple successful large-scale mixed income, mixed use, mixed finance development, while also providing the vision, skills, and leadership required to create vibrant communities that are well integrated into the urban uh, social fabric. Uh, the time of um, concentrating poverty and concentrating poor, poor people in one building, are, those times are gone and uh, we, we have to adjust by uh, redeveloping the public housing uh, portfolio that we have. 
So the HPHA as a state agency does bring a tremendous amount of resources, uh, a portfolio of significant land assets that have exceeded their life intended useful, uh, located in attractive urban fill uh, allocations. Many of them are along the rail that are well positioned for redevelopment. Statutory powers, including the power to acquire, manage, own and operate. Uh, the MTW designation, that we have mentioned, which allows us, among other things, to be able to project base more than the 20% limit for any other housing authority that is not an MTW. Also, the ability to apply to HUD to dispose and demolish federal public housing properties for development under what is called the Section 18 and or to convert to voucher funding that's are traditionally Section 8. Uh, these are uh, uh, very crucial and important to uh, to help in filling the gap uh, that re usually is created by building this kind of deep subsidized housing. And also the potential uh, to access public housing operating subsidies. Uh, we have a contract and uh, uh, the ACC contract with, with HUD to be able to do that. And as you know, and thank you uh, for Act 251 Social Law, uh, that allows us to develop and mixed income and mixed finance housing projects statewide. Our vision, uh, uh, we have received zoning and time and approval for the development of nearly about 1500 units so far um, and uh, have the environmental clearances for nearly 2,500 more. Uh, the scale, we believe that uh, the expansion of the existing uh, public-private partnership efforts to reposition our public housing properties on state land is the most advantage, advantageous, uh, cost-effective and efficient method to expand the state's existing housing inventory. And uh, uh, to realize the goal, uh, we uh, sought a master developer to lead the redevelopment efforts to deliver an additional 10,000 units, of which 10% uh, will be uh, for sale, the component 99 year lease home ownership, and approximately 90% 90, 90 or about 9,000 uh, additional units will be for rental serving any income from zero to 120 AMI using a variety of resources. Uh, the HPHA conducted a, a strategic plan, a down uh, top-to-down analysis of all of our portfolio to determine the potential options for uh, the conversion. Uh, this undertaking included a thorough review of the physical and uh, uh, operating needs and the current financial performance of each of our properties across the state. And as a result of this review, the HPHA identified the portfolio uh, of properties that we consider to be especially attractive for redevelopment. Uh, these properties have generally exceeded their intended uh, useful life and are expected to be eligible for redevelopment under the section, section 18 or the red blend that may be eligible for exemptions from uh, certain state and county statutes. Uh, this is a, an example of the portfolio review that was done for each of our properties. Uh, as a part of this, uh, we analyze HUD development cost limits, uh, the TDCs, and various HUD subsidies programs, uh, including Section 18, Demo Dispo, and RAD, and key financing terms to determine the amount of debt that could be supported by each individual properties. Once we identify the developer, sometimes very, very soon, we will be sharing this with them so they are able to put in a, a, a good performa uh, trying to minimize the amount of gap that will be generated. So why these pro uh, properties are excellent candidates? Uh, one, the ground up development provides an opportunity to involve residents and deliver high quality, comfortable and inviting communities in which to live, work and play, while also having the potential of far reaching uh, transformative uh, impacts, just as opportunity to incorporate recre recreational spaces together with green building and sustainability concept that will contribute to improved individual health, well-being, quality of life, and sense of connectedness uh, for the existing and future residents. Uh, 
uh, communities that are well connected uh, through fairs and interconnected activities, streets and encouragement, walking, biking, uh, which in turn supports a community that is safe and healthy. Uh, reduced urban sprawl, land consumption, traffic congestion, dependence on uh, fossil oil and greenhouse emissions, thereby improving the overall health and quality of life in these areas. And also having that uh, uh, support of residents via services, counseling and financial assistance. And equally as important, uh, uh, not to have a concentration of poverty, that, uh, that your neighbor uh, could be a professor, your neighbor could be a, a police officer, or it could be a dishwasher or housekeeper. Uh, several, of, several of the properties in our portfolio are located near heart rail stations and are currently listed on the state TUD strategic plan. Uh, the neighborhood TUD plan allows increased building height of up to 400 feet, in some locations and significantly higher density of up to 7.5 FAR. And TOD plans provide also land use and circulation frameworks to guide future development and encourage higher density housing and uh, units that are in despair in the local residential neighborhood to be able to, to be completely redone. Uh, also, the redevelopment along the rail will result in more impact livable, commu uh, livable communities that can that can take full advantage of the benefits of the transit, uh, specifically creating new transportation options while encouraging economic growth and attractive redevelopment in these areas. Uh, this overlay shows the proximity of our public housing properties to the heart uh, rail station. Uh, as you can see, uh, very, very conveniently we located within uh, less than a mile, uh, most within a half a mile. Uh, the portfolio that the RFQ includes um, is uh, summarized in this slide. It, it includes, uh, uh, just go directly to it, first and foremost is may right homes. And our requirement is that that will be the very first phase, the very first property that will be developed uh, uh, the reason for that is uh, much of the work we have completed on our own uh, from the NEPA, EIS, and others. So the developer will be well equipped to immediately move on this project. So this one is a requirement that we have put in RFQ and people, uh, multiple uh, developers have responded to that RFQ. The existing mayor right housing uh uh, it sits on about 15 acres. It has 364 public housing units, uh, 35, two and three stories, and it was built in 1953, about 70 years old. Uh, uh, the master planning, the NEPA, uh, the historic uh, historical preservation was completed, NEPA completed. Uh, utilities are available for the first two phases. And uh, we thank you very much for the 10 million appropriation for the pre-development that will allow us to move forward. We anticipate on this one here, based on the plans we already have, to increase the density from 364 unit to 2,448 uh, units, which includes one for one replacement of the public housing units through a voucher program. It also contemplates approximately 50,000 square feet of commercial space. Uh, the second one, very attractive along the rail next to the stadium. It's an 11.5 acre site for Uwamomi. It currently has 260 public housing units constructed in 1960, uh, 1969 and literally sits uh, on the uh, on, on heart of uh, on the one of the stations in the heart of uh, less than a block or about a block. Uh, the proposed for instead of 260 units is to increase density to 2,170 units of affordable housing also includes one for one replacement of those 260 units. And the development will integrate uh, and complement the proposed redevelopment of the Aloha Stadium uh, that, that is hopefully ongoing. Uh, the, uh, the other site is Kamehameha Homes and Kaahumana Homes, uh, two separate but uh, 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 attached, totally, totally in about 24 acres, containing 376 public housing units. Uh, there are three-tenths of a mile, about 
0.75 miles from the future Kalihi and uh, uh, Kapalama Heart Station. Uh, they are also next to Kalihi Kai Elementary School, uh, King David uh, uh, Kalakawa Middle School, Farrington High School, and Kalakawa District Park. Uh, the proposal here is up to 3,000 instead of 376, about tenfold of new affordable housing, um, create an exceptional opportunity uh, to work within the city and county and uh, uh, DOE to combine resources and upgrade schools and parks. Uh, the other one that we have identified in our RFQ is uh, Halilalima in Per City. It's a four, a four acre site, has only 36 public housing units, uh, nine two story buildings, and was built in 81, half a mile from the Per Highland station and within walking distance from civic facilities, including the public library, community parks, elementary school, uh, per city bus complex, police station, community service, and others. Uh, this is proposed to increase that to up to 1,000 new affordable housing instead of the only the 36 units that exist there. Uh, the other property that we ad identified is Nanakoli Homes in YNI. Uh, it's located on Farrington Highway uh, in the Nanakuli at the southern end of the Waianae coast, approximately 30 miles from Honolulu, uh, close to the beach park and located directly across from the street, 4.24 acres, and it was first occupied in 1969. This site has a potential of uh, producing 500 units. Uh, the Lanak Lanakila Homes in Hilo, Hawaii, uh, the Lanakila sits on approximately 29 acres uh, with approximately 10 acres vacant located on the big island of Hawaii. Uh, built during the uh, Truman administration, the property has undergone significant redevelopment in various phases over the last two decades. And HPHA has grandfathered the right to redevelop 62 low income, low income public housing there. Our current preliminary master plan, which was funded by TOD CIP funding that you have granted, and thank you for that. It's provided uh, that uh, indicate we can have the capacity to build there in an empty lot that we have uh, between 250 and 300 units. And we're working closely with the county uh, and that vacant uh, uh, lot that we own. Uh, redeveloping the occupied uh, portions of the site, which is the area adjacent to the project site, with all the blue roofs that you see on the left, those are existing public housing that uh, have been completed. And the uh, county is encouraging density in this area, and we are in discussions with them, as I mentioned, mm -hmm. to potentially include a multi-model transportation hub uh, within the overall development. Uh, this area has a contaminated soil uh, 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 that is being managed in, through a soil management on the northern east side of, uh, of the site. Uh, Kehekili Terrace in Maui. Uh, this is a great property and it's also part of the RFQ uh, uh, to develop. It's located on the island of Maui. The property was first occupied in 1966. Um, there is a, a, a two separate land, two separate land uh, in parcels, as you can see, site A and site B. Site A is approximately 3.8 acres and site B is about 1.4. And the site is located at the southeast corner of the intersection of Market Street and Wailuku uh, redevelopment area. Uh, the legis legislature has also provided HPHA with a CIP planning grant uh, for this site, which we deployed uh, and will continue to deploy once the developer is selected. And the uh, the other property, part of the RFQ, the, the nine major uh, properties that we had identified in the RFQ, it's the Kapa'a uh, located in Kauai. Uh, this is the ninth project that's been identified the property was first uh, occupied in uh, 1966, uh, totaling 4.33 uh, acres. And we are in the preliminary stages of evaluating this site. Uh, we believe it can support an, uh, an addition uh, 110 or so units. So the minimum requirements of the program 
uh, that we have mandated and the basis of which multiple developers have applied uh, uh, for that RFQ. One is the delivery of a minimum of 10,000 additional units uh, over multiple phases, uh, funding, permitting, uh, the ability to add and exchange portfolio properties once we do all the studies. If we determine that, let's say a property that we estimated 2,000 can only do, do 1,500, uh, we can substitute one of the properties that we also uh, uh, identified in the RFQ. One-for-one uh, -one replacement for public housing so we can keep uh, public housing uh, alive. And uh, it, when I say public housing, it could be uh, public housing or if you convert it into Section 8. Uh, what we mean by this is that those of any income are able to apply and if they're selected, they can uh, have a unit regardless of what the income is. As I stated earlier, if the income is zero, they pay zero rent. And in some cases, not only they pay zero rent, but we do pay them through the federal government uh, monies so they can pay for the utilities. Uh, we also require the mixed income uh, development uh, so we can uh, make sure they concentrate the poverty and make sure that the the, the poor people are not all gathered in one area and one neighborhood. We also uh, uh, unit integration and neighborhood integration, uh, maximizing the non-state financial resources is a requirement in the RFQ that the developer has to be savvy enough uh, to, 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 to maximize non-state financial resources. Uh, obviously, non-discrimination, uh, sustainability, accessibility, because our our, our uh, a population is is aging. Uh, 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 streetscape improvement, uh, including open and defensible areas, and leveraging transit oriented development opportunities. Uh, the developer minimum requirements that we required is one proven track record to successfully developing, managing, and completing multiple projects simultaneously, using multiple financing sources. Uh, another requirement is successful completion of multiple projects using LITET. Uh, we also required successful financing project using qualified 501c3 bonds. Uh, identify a dedicated full-time team to execute the project. Uh, knowledgeable about start-to-finish development process as well as development challenges in Hawaii and experiencing national contract securing construction materials directly from suppliers and manufacturers. Those are some of the uh, requirements. As far as the key responsibilities is a robust community engagement. We make sure that the community is engaged so we can have a vibrant community, not just housing. Uh, creating a conceptual master plan options for each property. Uh, keeping the HPHA informed and involved in decision-making as a partner to expedite the approval process, securing zoning, entitlement, subdivision, and other necessary approvals, preparing phase-specific development and operation performers, maintaining and executing complete and accurate project schedules, managing and overseeing the pre-development and development activities, project consultants, general contractors, co-developers, uh, and uh, identify all the necessary funding uh, commitments and how they intend to seek it. And uh, the financial closing, construction, lease up, and management of the completed projects. Uh, these are some of the development uh, steps that we have to do. As you know, what applies to any developer does apply to us, uh, to the HPHA. So there's a lot of work that we have to do uh, that take months and years prior to even applying to the county or to HHFDC. Uh, uh, this uh, includes uh, utility verification, master planning development, market analysis, community and native Hawaiian engagement, the NEPA environment. Uh, most of the properties that we selected are, um, are federal properties that, and thereby not only the, uh, they require an EIS, but they will also require a NEPA environmental review. Also, historical preservation review, environmental hazardous material studies, phase ones and phase two, schematic designs and design development. Then we go to the county for the zoning and entitlement approval to ONH. And then we complete after that the subdivision and condo approvals. Then we apply 
uh, for HHFDC after the successful uh, application, then we start the construction documentation, specification, permitting reviews, lender selections, HUD section 18, demo dispo applications, uh, resident reloca relocations, financial closing, demo environmental remedies if required, construction, lease up, uh, stabilization and operation, et cetera. Uh, alignment of the RFQ with the overall goal of our state. Uh, one, uh, we explored uh, through this RFQ and the selection of the developer uh, alternate financial uh, option to mitigate the bond cap restraints that we have. And that is why we required uh, the developer to have experience in 501c3 because it does not affect the bond cap. Uh, the, the, the second operation of properties post completion and lease up, uh, cost of materials. And that's why we require securing bulk pricing and managing supply chain, uh, maximizing the price, the price of low income tax credit by going to a syndicator with the potential of 10,000 units, you got a much higher rate for your tax credit than if you go for 100 units or 200 units as an example. Uh, organizing of an environmental review, historical preservation and master planning over multiple properties simultaneously to help also uh, uh, give data to the legislature on everything that's been done so they can prioritize which project they would like to fund. And managing of the waitlist and residential and, and the resident relocation uh, sequencing management distribution across the islands and counties and a single point of accountability with development partner. And instead of having 20 or 30 developers working on 20, 30 uh, uh, different properties, this process that we have selected will allow us to have a single point of accountability uh, with the known knowledge and acknowledgement that the developers can, and most of them will, uh, partner with other developers uh, to do other sites simultaneously. So with that, I'll, uh, that concludes our uh, presentation. And myself and my team are here to answer any questions that you may have. And again, thank you very, very much for the opportunity today. Thank you very much for that presentation, Director. Um, maybe at this time, we can let our house counterparts go first if there are any questions. Members, we have any questions? Rep. Evzen, go ahead. Yeah, thanks for the presentation. Um, Thank you. I have, I have a question. So you mentioned a number of times mixed income. Um, and you also mentioned for the 10,000 units that you're looking at zero to 120% AMI. So when you're saying mixed income, is that mixed income within zero to 120% or are you folks uh, able or looking into doing market rate units or units above 120? So uh, currently we're contemplating up to 120% uh, EMI. The, the bulk of the units will be in there. If there is a need, for example, for the developer to make the performer work and the financial model to work to do some, uh, then we will discuss that with the developer. Our concentration is to, to provide uh, the, the overwhelming amount of affordable housing. And the reason we went up to uh, 120 as well uh, we the, the zero to sixty, especially thirty to sixty, is kind of covered by light tech. Uh, zero to thirty will be covered by some of the subsidies that we get from the federal government. There is that gap of sixty to eighty, which we hope that uh, very soon income averaging will be uh, part of uh, uh, of the state of Hawaii, so which allows us to go up to hundred to eighty percent by doing the income averaging. And the 501c3 qualifies for 80 to 120 AMI, and that's why we put that 501c3 bond in. So those are the financial uh, resources to do that spectrum of the unit. But the overwhelming majority of the units, uh, uh, probably more than 85 or so percent, will be uh, the uh, affordable housing. Okay, and, and so there's nothing in statute that stops you from going um, above 120? No, right. no, it does not. Yes. And then another question. Um, for your units on Kauai, yes. or I guess in general, when you're identifying the, the projects, um, were you um, 
looking, you know, on the each island's respective general plans for targeted growth areas for those islands, or was it more so looking to where you folks had existing projects that you could expand? Uh, the only reason I ask is, is on Kauai, our general plan is pretty clear to try and direct the growth into Lihue and not Kapa, um, you know, whereas your folks project is in Kapa. Yeah, so we, we, we look at the, uh, the underutilized properties that had the potential of increasing density. Uh, we also looked at uh, properties that are federal, but we have been, uh, we worked uh, uh, closely with uh, Representative uh, Nakamura at the time when we, uh, as, as part of that, and I think there is a bill for that property uh, for pre-development costs and all of that. We we contacted and worked closely with the county that end up confirming that we can do three times the amount of the units and the sewer capacity. Uh, there is enough uh, infrastructure for that. Uh, 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 same way with Maui and uh, uh, the, the, the Big Island, uh, we we always work with uh, all the entities to make sure that uh, the property that we identify is the right fit and uh, that it matches the overall need of that county or of uh, the state in general. Uh, but we, do, we did choose uh, mainly federal properties because of the federal subsidies that are essentials uh, of uh, maintaining these units once they're built. Got it. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Members, any other questions? I have a question. If Great. It's time for the same. Well, thanks for the presentation, Director. I appreciate it. And uh, th uh, thank you for putting uh, Mayor Wright Holmes at the top of the list of the, uh, the portfolio. I, I looking at the number there for Mayor Wrights, it doesn't sound very high. I mean, the, the block I live in in Chinatown, I think probably has almost 2,000 units, and I'm pretty sure it's a smaller chunk of property. Why, why are we uh, why are we putting so few people there? Yeah, uh, th thank you, Senator, for the question. Uh, the the number of about 2,500 units uh, that uh, that Mayor Wright will be tr transformed to came through the community engagement, and there was a lot of pushback. Uh, we agree with you that we can certainly put more there, uh, but the number that seemed to have acceptance from the from the neighbors and from the community was that number of about 2,500, 2,448 units, uh, plus some commercial spaces. Okay, well, I hope we can uh, push the envelope as much as possible because it's a it's a big lot that, as you're well aware, pretty yes. much everything on it is needs to come down. Uh, one other question about that location. I, I view it as a very good location with the possible exception that if you look at the sea level rise maps at the three, at the at the one meter level, uh, you know, the, the uh, corner of Liliha and King Street is beachfront property. Um, these buildings presumably will last for 100 years or so, and the ones that are there have lasted 70, so hopefully we build them better than this batch. Um, have you considered moving moving farther uh, Malka on the property to avoid that problem? Well, one thing that we're requiring the developers to do is to do a study and to, to make some accommodation as best. This will include what you mentioned, Senator. Uh, uh, also, uh, we, we, uh, we are committed to also figure out if we can put more, as you know, it will trigger the federal AIS. But what we wanted to do for, for Mayor Wright is to immediately embark on at least phase one and phase two, the 650 units, start building it as we can do additional studies uh, to see how we can increase the density. Uh, but the studies, as far as the the the, the high sea rise and all of that, uh, do, it will be done uh, once the developer is identified. And okay. we will share this comment uh, with them as well. Okay, thank you. I appreciate, uh, appreciate the emphasis. It's taken way too long, but uh, better, late, better late than never. Thank you. Thanks, Jared. Uh, T thank you very much. And just to add, if I could, uh, uh, Senator Rhodes, uh, the preliminary study that we've done a couple of years ago, uh, uh, we're not projected to be impacted uh, uh, by sea uh, level rise uh, based on the current tables, but we'll refresh that study and we'll share it with you as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, thank you, Director. I have a few questions. Um, 
So first, um, you mentioned the community outreach was going to be um, a significant part of the plan. Um, what kind of community outreach have you done for the parcels in question already? So for for the mayor right housing, uh, as you know, we've done for each project that prior to submitting the two one H, that's mayor right, uh, the the uh, school street and the KPT, we've done multiple meetings, not just the 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 tenants, uh, but also uh, the neighbors, all the neighbors in general. Uh, for for KPT, it took about. A year and a half through uh, uh, tr to do a transformation plan and they included uh, the schools, included DOE, included nonprofits that are there, included neighbors to be able to come up with that with that plan. So the the community engagement will consist of uh, from from the beginning starting what 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 our goal is and and uh, engage the community, show them the benefit of having uh, demolishing, let's say, a public housing that's 80 years old or 60 years old and replacing it with uh, uh, with a much better model. Uh, it also, it helped, for example, School Street. A lot of people, when they hear Hawaii Public Housing Authority developing, they, they automatically think uh, we are developing homeless housing and public housing. And that was one of the big misunderstandings uh, for example, from School Street that had a lot of opposition in the beginning, and then they endorsed the 800 units. Um, and then throughout, uh, for our uh, residents, we're obligated under the law, the federal law, to engage them and keep them informed. Uh, but we always bring the, the wider community uh, uh, just to make sure to, that they know what's coming to the neighborhood. If there are any concerns that are uh, legitimate concerns, we certainly do address them. Uh, and we start uh, designing based on that. For example, Mayor Wright, one of the issues was uh, crime, that they were concerned for crime. So there was a lot of visibility uh, positioning the buildings in a way that uh, 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 can mitigate that issue. Uh, so there's that's the purpose of it, and that's how we, we intend on, on doing it. For the other parcels that you didn't enumerate, when do you anticipate large-scale community consultation to take place? Uh, so uh, immediately, so the, the RFQ calls for simultaneous uh, uh, engagement of the community and all the, the, the units at the same time. Uh, we'll still, uh, the mayor right will still go maybe one or two meetings because we're ready for it uh, to start to start actually designing and building. Uh, uh, the the other the other units, for example, and Akila and others, there was a community engagement, uh, but immediately after signing a, a, a programmatic uh, agreement with the developer, they'll start multiple sites at the same time, and that in itself will determine how many units each site uh, uh, can handle and how we're going to go about phasing it within by project and then by phase. Uh, we also had multiple meetings with the neighborhood boards just uh, as part of that comprehensive engagement. Um, so, um, I guess I'll have questions, but they're kind of related. So, um, as you know, Director, I have a, I, I strongly oppose income restrictions. I believe that income restrictions are un-American. I believe that public services should be for the public, like public highways, public parks, public schools, all of which are completely income blind. I heard you say that the reason why the great bulk of the units will be affordable up to 120% AMI is because of the 501c3 tax exempt bonds that you anticipate will be used for most of the financing. But I you know, I've eviscerated your sister agency, HHFDC, for charging up to 100% AMI for rentals that are taxpayer subsidized, which comes out to $2,940 a month for a two-bedroom unit. At 120% of AMI, a two-bedroom unit costs $3,528 a month, which is a lot of money um, for a two-bedroom unit. I mean, I, I think that's significantly above market in all but a handful of neighborhoods in the entire state. Um, and so I, um, I see that that market is probably, you're probably tapping into more of an ownership market. And, and so I guess 
The second part of the question is why do you limit the ownership component to only 10% of the units instead of a greater percentage? I just have a hard time imagining that there are that many people who are going to rent two bedroom units for $3,500 a month. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Senator Chang. Uh, we, first of all, we agree that uh, once you get to that income level, and we, we, a study that was recently done does demonst demonstrate once you get to 120, you are in home ownership. And that's why uh, we, we, we're trying to build some, some, of the, uh, some of the homes for that, for home ownership, and encourage that. Uh, so the, the studies will determine that. The reason that we only put 1,000, but we're also subject to increase, is that we wanted to at least start with the first tower of 300 units for sale, uh, sale component and open the wait list. Uh, that I think it will show uh, uh, the, the the public, the legislature, and everyone the tremendous amount of need that is needed, and if desired by the legislature, we're certainly uh, able and happy to build even more uh, than than a thousand. We thought that a thousand is just a good start, and that's why we said approximately. Uh, but we, from everything we see and hear, there is a tremendous amount of needs. That the only reason we're including up to uh, uh, the 501c3 bond has a certain requirement, 80 to 120. Uh, we, we'll do a lot of 80s, and uh, uh, we may do some of the 120s depending on the performer and how to work. But we will do a study, uh, refresh a study that was done uh, by one of the developers that shows even in Kaka'ako, once you go to 120, you, you're already at market kind of rate so we're in agreement on that um so um can you correct my misimpression that the rfq is currently calling for up to 1000 units and not 1000 or potentially more than 1000 yeah so what we call this approximately 1000 and approximately 9000 of rentals uh which uh through the negotiations uh that, that is what's called but we can also uh easily uh, you know, go out for for an updated RFQ uh, to increase and just go for, for example, uh, to build 2,000 additional, 4,000 or 5,000. Uh, there is tremendous amount of land uh, out there that we can, we can add. This was meant, that 1,000, to just really demonstrate to the community the need uh, that, that we know exist uh, and then uh, build more. Uh, Okay, well, I, I would I would certainly encourage you to do so. Just by way of um, comparison, both the House and Senate Housing Committees recently toured um, an office to residential conversion. Um, the residence is at Bishop Place, and I'm looking at their rents. Their one bedroom, one bath rents were twenty seven to twenty eight hundred dollars. Those are market units, and Honolulu County one twenty AMI is twenty nine forty a month. So. 120 AMI is above the market for some of the most, for brand new units with some of the most lavish amenities of any, you know, apartment building slash condo tower in the state. So, um, and as we observed, a lot of those units, probably the plurality of those units were being rented not by local people, but by military um, uh, service members with, you know, really large federal housing allowances. And so I, I fear that we're missing the, the sweet spot of demand here. Um, I'll just, uh, um, I'll just ask one final question then, Director. Yeah, of I'll course. Turn it over to the House, which is, um, so you, you talked about the 501c3 bonds, you talked about applying for LIHTC through the, the process that's available to everybody. Um, but uh, to my recollection, you have not asked for specific appropriations for the legislature. Do you require any resources from the legislature to bring this RFQ to fruition? Uh, thank you, Senator. Yes, yes, we have, and we have submitted uh, a certain requests for, for for this. I don't think <clears throat> I don't think it showed up on the on the budgets. Uh, but we did we did submit. I think it has to go through the the governor and BNF. Uh, uh, mind you that this RFQ was completed and fashioned uh, uh, right along the start of the legislative session. But we did request for funding 
for 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 this, uh, including uh, some pre-development that was in uh, GM2 uh, to, to start the pre-development. So that way we have all the data to come back next year uh, for, for the actual development. <clears throat> and I'll, I'll share that with you. Uh, I'll send it to, to the committees. Yes, please. That would be helpful. Thank you very much. Um, Thank you. Uh, one last thing, if I could uh, rest assured that we're very incentivized and we, we want to build more. We, we know the value. And uh, with, with your support, legislati legislative support, we can and we, and, and we will. So I, I do thank you for the comments and we appreciate that. All right, Vice Chair, go ahead. Thank you, Director. You know, listening to um, Chair Chang's question, um, my question is, what is the turnover ratio of people uh, in, in public housing um, as far as um, getting the subsidy and then, you know, earning enough income and then moving out of the public housing system that we have? Are we seeing high turnover or... Are, are the same people in the same units for the last 10, 10 years or, or so? Yeah, uh, th thank you, Representative, for the question. Uh, uh, unfortunately, we do have multi-generational poverty and, and one of the biggest elements, uh, some of uh, the most vulnerable folks and the, the, poor, the, the, the poor folks, there is nothing in, in the middle. So they are at public housing, for example, paying 30% of their income. And let's say that rent for Two, two bedroom because it's large family. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, three bedroom for large family. Let's say it's $300. For them to go to the market and pay 24, 25, 2600, they start making that calculation. I have to get two more jobs just to be able to afford what I have right now. And so we don't see a lot of turnover. We do, however, have few success stories, a lot of them actually, of folks graduating out of public housing and going to 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 others to, to other housing. But the number is low. I can provide you with that uh, statistic. Uh, in all, about three to five hundred families vacate uh, the public housing each year. Uh, I will say uh, about three hundred ish families translate uh, uh, transition. Uh, by choice, which means that they decided to leave uh, the public housing and they, the other numbers are through evictions and other things. So, so out of six, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. So the number is low, uh, out of 6,200 units, about 300 a year uh, transitions. Okay, uh, so I'm, I'm just trying to figure out the goal of HPHA if, if it's, you know, if we're not giving, if it's not really you know, a state subsidy that's getting people income mobility or, or moving out of the program. What are, what are we trying to accomplish by building all of the units? Okay, thank you. So, so a couple of things. One, uh, these assets are underutilized. Uh, the, there's some, for example, uh, Mayor Wright, that has a minimum potential of 2,500 units, only have 364, all poor, all uh, zero to 15 or so percent AMI. So the goal number one is to a uh, social justice, whereby uh, a deconcentration of poverty, because that in itself make the people want to do better. The second- as, oh, as, I, I'm going to stop you there because it doesn't seem like people are doing better. I'm you're, sorry. You're saying, you're saying it doesn't seem like people are doing better. You said about only 300 people out of your 6,200 units are moving out. So how are we really, how are they really doing better? Because the rent outside the public housing is extremely expensive. Uh, you know, for example, uh, the, the essential things, dishwashers and housekeepers and others, the income increases that they earn is not that high. And, and therefore they still qualify under that range. Uh, one of the uh, uh, things that we have, for example, uh, self-sufficiency program, we have few people that graduate from there. We came to the legislature, as you as you know, requesting $500,000 to do some educational programs and others, training the people to move. But that's the extent that we can do. So long as, uh, so long as these folks are not making living wage and more than living wage to afford housing outside the public housing and they remain there and that is the unfortunate reality okay. okay thank you chair thank you anyone other questions okay i have a few questions hakeem 
Sure. Um, thanks, thanks for the presentation. I think it's good to, to see this again and to kind of go over some of the particulars. I, I'm very, very curious to see when the award comes out. I, I think before that does happen, I, I want to understand and have some assurances of when you're going to award this you know, contract, you know, what, what are we going to be on the hook for, you know, like in, in terms of what is it, what are the deal breakers to you that will, will be, we, we can't sign a contract with, with the developer, for example, like, you know, in terms of if they're asking for some type of minimum requirements of, of financing or putting the state on the hook before you get an appropriation, is that a no go for you? Because when I read this RFQ, it, it seems like there's no money attached, right? The only money that I see is the 10 million that you have for Mayor Wright. And so I'm assuming, you know, at a certain point that, you know, what assurances do they have that they'll make money off of doing this master planning if they don't know that, um, you know, it's, uh, they're going to be able to build some of these things, right? Because because part of it is, I, I'm not sure, are, are they going to, I guess the, the question is, is, is there a minimum that you're going to be okay with? Or is the expectation that there is no cost to the state in, in starting this master planning? Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, we making it clear, not only with th this RFQ, but previous developers, that we do not guarantee funding. Only the legislature can guarantee funding, and we can only articulate that that has been appropriated to us already. Uh, the reason that we had multiple developers that were interested in this, uh, in this uh, RFQ is they know uh, that there is a crisis. They know that the legislature, the governor, both House and Senate support building affordable housing. And what we're trying to do here is just work with them to provide all the data to the legislature so they are able to appropriate what they deem uh, necessary. So if a developer said, guarantee me X amount of dollars, that's a deal breaker. We walk away. We go to the next in line uh, because we cannot guarantee the funding, it's just uh, only the legislature can get can guarantee funding. So, so that's if, how, I'm sorry. So if there's an exit clause, you, you won't sign the contract. Uh, meaning if there is. If, if we don't, if they're not able to build something, right, and make their money back and they're only able to do the master planning, you're, you're not going to sign that contract. If there's no, a... I, I mean, we, the contract will contemplate that. Uh, either either the state or the developer uh, can leave for convenience uh, with the certain conditions. Uh, the studies and everything that's going to be done for the, the pre-development phase, uh, if they can't build anything, they have a, they, they, they can walk away, yes. Uh, we, we know what, what are we well. guaranteeing him, though, to do in the pre-development phase? I know that we have $10 million for Mayor Wright, but is that all they're pretty much guaranteed? What we guarantee, and uh, that will be through negotiation. The RFQ has not guaranteed any any funding. It says funding is subject to legislative appropriation, and and any contract agreement or anything will say that same language. No matter what we agree, for example, uh, uh, for School Street, we agreed to 50-50 for pre-development costs, and the language is subject to. Uh, uh, legislative approval, and then we came to you, and you gave us the two million. Then we went back, and uh, we got the four million, and and all of that. Uh, I think the the developers, especially savvy developers, do understand uh, that state agencies uh, are cannot uh, uh, guarantee funding. That has to come. We agree on the terms, subject to appropriations, and we were able to successfully sign. Uh, uh, at least three master development agreements that okay. way. No, I, I'm just I'm just curious because you know to to plan to, to plan for ten thousand units with no guarantee of anything. I, I'm curious to see who's going to sign that. I just don't want to make I want to just make sure there's no loopholes that's going to put us on the hook for something that if we don't go forward with this that we're going to have to to pay out. I, I, so that's that's a concern. The other concern is. You know, when, when you take a look at doing such a large project, I, I take a look at West Oahu and when UH tried to do this, their, their large master, master developer at West Oahu. And I'm wondering 
what makes this project different that you can develop 10,000 units and it didn't happen in West Oahu? What, what, what are we offering that they didn't that in your mind will make this a success? Yeah, so th there's, there's a couple things. One, uh, these are federal properties. They come with certain subsidies. Number two, uh, we are an MTW public housing agency that able to uh, provide uh, other subsidies just as the project base uh, that can be used for the performer. Uh, after it's built, there is money from the federal government to uh, to subsidize those those housing. Uh, uh, also, the the uh, with regards to the assurances that they have, uh, this is what then they get the stuff done uh, as we start building it. Uh, it. There is other funding that we get uh, from the legislature. Uh, for Lanakila, as an example, we'll continue to do that. Uh, this, the selection is also is, is very, very important. Uh, and the location of these units uh, along the rail right in the heart of Honolulu, it, it's also, I think, uh, very, very, very attractive to developers. And that's why we were pleasantly very happy and surprised uh, by the amount of folks that actually, knowing all of this, have submitted a solid, solid application. And with regards to your earlier question, uh, Representative, I, I I do have with me our, our team that's reviewing uh, this program programmatic uh, agreement and all of that uh, from the AG's office. If you want me to address that, if you want me to address that question, uh, the concern. No, 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 it, it's fine. I, I I think all all I want to make sure, Hakim, is yes, don't get a bad deal, right? I agree. Right. And and. Yes, sir. At the end of this, if something happens, if we don't fund something that we do not want to be on the hook, because I think at some point, you know, we, we may want to pivot. Who knows, right? I, I sure. think it's a grand plan, but at a certain point, you may have to break these projects up just for expediency's sake, right? And, you know, I think that we, we need that flexibility to, to do something like that. But as long as long as you can guarantee that that's that's contemplated and we're not going to get ourselves into a bad deal, I'm OK. I, I want to see what the results are. So thank you. Yes. No, Chair, I, I, I certainly can. I can guarantee and I know this is taped. I can definitely guarantee that uh, through that and also through phasing. Uh, because we what what we said to these uh, developers is that we may just end up doing phase one because that's all the money that there is. But our goal and our desire is to do ten thousand units, and and we also know the the financial environment changes. So when the legislature has a surplus, they may want to say, "Hey, uh, HPHA, go ahead and build three thousand right away." And if the if the, if it's not there, they may say this year we can't give you anything. So we understand that, and we want to make sure. And our, uh, uh, equally as important, our AGs clearly understand that. So we will we will make sure. Yeah. Thank you, Hakeem. Thank you, Chair. I think just um, one final question um, to yes. follow up yes, with Chair question. So where are we in the RFQ process right now? Uh, <clears throat> so because this is a public meeting, I, I can say this. Uh, we we had we had multiple uh, uh, developers, the selection committee consisting of nine members of the community and staff uh, ha have done a certain evaluation and that we are continuing right now uh, uh, entering into phase two of it. We anticipate uh, uh, declaring who the developer is uh, within the next 60 days. Okay, great. And when do you anticipate the first units to be delivered and the last units to be delivered? Uh, funding permitting, uh, the first one will be the mayor right. Uh, uh, that will be uh, 650 units, 300 for sale, 350 for rent. Uh, in, in the mayor right homes. Uh, we anticipate coming next session to the legislature for the funding for that, for that, for that project. And we, one of the things that we're, we're also requiring is uh, once we do certain studies that, that's required to determine how many units and all of that, we will do a, a, 
project by phase by project for each of the years and the amount of, of funding and the amount of units which we will absolutely share with you. Um, okay, that's all I got. That's all, all set. Okay, then there being no further business, the committees are now adjourned. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you.